watching the Vision Channel, where Habakkuk 2 and 2 says, write the vision and make it plain so they that see it can take it and run with it. This is the channel where faith and vision collide to bring forth a manifestation. You're watching the Vision Channel. Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to our broadcast today, this afternoon on the Vision Channel, on Christ is King. And I really believe that if we pay close attention, there are times and seasons where God will release certain revelations, certain things that he transpires, that he releases in the earth, and we have to have an attentive ear in order to hear it. When you look between the time period between Malachi and Matthew was over 400 years and God was silent. And there are times that God is silent and there are times when God gives the mitigated God and he speaks. And we have to be attentive to what he's saying in this season because what he says at times can become critical of what's to come next. This is what prophecy means. This is what we do when we had prophets in the Old Testament, how they would proclaim, Isaiah would proclaim that Jesus, who he would become, he would be called a counselor, an everlasting father, a prince of peace. He would give us the very details of who Christ would be and the names that he would come and operate and function in. And God sometimes will give words, words of reconciliation, words of judgment, words of clarity, he will give revelation. There are certain words that he will release in the earth realm that we are still waiting on things to come. This is why. You're, as intercessors, as us being intercessors, not everybody is called to be an intercessor, but everyone is called to pray. This is why the Bible said, and we should pray and not faint. And God is looking for the believers in this season that when prophecies or words of prophecies are to be fulfilled, he's looking for the believers to war according to those prophecies so that things will materialize and manifest because people have no idea the difficulties and the challenges that just you coming along with somebody giving you a prophetic word. Their prophets come and release the word, and that's a great thing. They come and then they leave. And you're excited about things and events changing or taking place, but there are some things that will never change in your life. If Even if you receive a prophetic word, even if God has said it, even if it's right on your street or right down your road, that God is telling you exactly what you need in the time that you'll need it. But if you don't adhere to what God truly have to say, then you can miss seasons, not warring according to the prophecy that was given to you. And when you find people that's been 20 and 30 years, 40 years or 10 years or five years, that that word has not materialized. It's not that the prophet is not being accurate. It's not that the prophet didn't tell the truth. It's just that now you've never waged a good warfare that was according to your own prophecy, that was according to God's will. So we sit back and we allow things to pass times to pass and season to pass and we never manifest or the word never manifests so we think that God is a lie and that God is not on our side it's not that God is not on your side God has been on your side because it was God who gave the prophet the ability to be able to hear what heaven was saying to release your word but this is the season where God is desiring for us to wage a good warfare According to the word that was released to you, according to the word that he released to your children, according to the word that he released over your marriage, there are things that transpire in the earth where it's going to take your participation. We think God is going to do it without our participation. No, God needs your participation in the earth to manifest the word that he gave you. There is a scripture, and this scripture says, in the book of Psalms, forever is the word settled in heaven. If that word is settled in heaven, to mean settled means there's an assurance. 
You have confidence that that word is in heaven. But how do you get heaven to earth? Jesus would come back and give us clarity and revelation and understanding that when he said that when he taught the apostles how to pray, he said, when you pray, pray that thy kingdom come. If the kingdom and your word is settled in heaven, that needs to be a resolve in the earth. But it takes warfare for you to release those words to manifest in the earth realm. No longer can we sit back and wait. No longer can we sit back and allow time to pass. Because in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, remember, said there is a time and a season. And sometimes we get the times and the seasons confused because God can give you things in time, but it may not be your season. But it takes you to stay consistent and wage a good warfare so that season can come, so that season can materialize. And, and this is why we have to be consistent and persistent in this season for this word that was spoken over your life to come to pass. You can no longer be lazy. You can no longer procrastinate. You can no longer do things out of season because God is waiting to move, but he's waiting for you to move so that can be a coupling. This is what faith is. Faith is just not saying something because in the body of Christ, we have made this mis misguided assumption that just because we can declare something in the atmosphere, but real faith is after your declaration, you make a step. And God is looking for you to make a step after your declaration. You can call it all and say you want, I have faith. I'm calling those things that be not as though they already are. But are you calling something that God wants you to meet? He needs you to meet where you called it. Abraham walked northward. Abraham walked southward. Abraham walked eastward and westward. Joshua, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, I can call it mine. Because when you get to that place, God knows that your faith was initiated. So now the land that Joshua needed to step on understood that he was operating in that place of faith. And God is looking to see if you're operating in that place of faith. That when you step on a property, step at a car dealership, step inside of a house, step inside of a job, that God is going to meet you at the point of your need, but you have to move beyond where you are. You cannot stay and say that you have faith. And many people, listen to me, God has given a word. And the word that he has given, you heard it by faith, you received it by faith, but you wasted faith because you didn't move in what he said. You stayed still thinking that God would do it all. God has done it all. He's created the world. He's came and he's died. He's did everything that he had to do, but now he's waiting on you. You cannot say that you're waiting on God because there's something that you must do when it's concerning God, when it's concerning you. I'm getting excited now. I'm getting excited because wheels are, something is starting to turn in me. Something is starting to turn. And, and listen to me, please hear this. Because I am an intercessor, because I am an intercessor, all of a sudden something begins to turn. Something begins to bubble up inside me. I don't know who's watching. I don't know who's watching. But the word I keep hearing is whirlwind. The word I keep hearing is whirlwind. I hear a whirlwind. See, this is how Elijah went up. Elijah went up in a whirlwind. And, this, and sometimes, please hear this, sometimes you have to call for whirlwinds. And I know some people are going through so many demonic attacks where the enemy has strategized against you and your family and you have no idea. Please hear me. This thing is burning in my heart now. This thing is in my spirit. Y'all, I'm excited because God is allowing me to see and release whirlwinds against your enemies. There are whirlwinds that are getting ready to be released against your enemies. Now, this is not my topic, but I don't know who this is for, that God is trying to tell you that this is your season and your hour to do two things. It is your season to wage war because God does not desire your prophecy to not come to pass where it seemed like God is not a God. No, God desires to be God in your life, and he wants to express himself in a way so that you can carry a testimony. But you have to be able to move in this season. You have to move by faith and not just speak by it. Because even the earth understands your movement. It understands when you move, it'll move on your behalf. 
And this is what God is trying to express today. He's trying to express that this is your season to move. Let me say this, please. Let me say this. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I'm praying that God will let me get back to the original message, but I don't know who I'm listening to. In the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 16, in Acts chapter 16, the Bible said the very first thing that they put on Paul in silence when they were in prison, it said they put their feet fast in the stocks. They prayed, they did everything that they could do, but it seemed like the enemy was hindering them when it came to their feet. Why did the enemy desire to use their feet to stop them? Because the feet is the place of authority. The feet is the place of governing. See, this, okay, the, the feet, when Jesus got ready to leave, the Bible said that he told the apostles, I desire to wash your feet. Why didn't he anoint their head? What was so significant about their feet? There's things that are so significant about your feet. Do you know that the same nerves that's in your brain is connected to your feet? Did you know that the very nerves that are in your foot are connected to your brain? Because this is how important the feet is. It's the feet that keeps the ability, that keeps you standing up, that can hold your own weight. It's the feet. So when Jesus got ready to leave, the first thing that he said, he was anointing their feet for what he said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Listen to me, please. The feet is where the authority is. It's where the authority is. So what they tried to, this is what was said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, if you don't know. The Bible said that the proclamation was made that there would be enmity, animosity, anger. There would be a fight between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. So there would always be great battles. There will always be a rivalry. And as long as you are in Christ, there will always be a rivalry and there will always be a battle. Because according to Revelation chapter 12, it said that the dragon came down, the serpent came down with the great wrath among the saints. Because the saints must understand that the authority that they have is in their feet. And God is trying to get us to understand that this authority that we have. Listen, he said this before time started. And then after the fall, then time began with Adam. But the word, remember I said, is forever settled in heaven. And God is trying to tell you that this word will not come back void. And God is looking for generations. He go through generation after generation looking to see that if he says, when I come into the earth, will I find faith? He's trying to find someone that can pick up the mantle to carry the authority of what he said from the beginning. And the word he said from the beginning, that he will bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. There's two things that are still inactive. Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of the Father, but he's given the authority unto the believers to crush the head of the serpent. He's still giving you authority to use with your feet. Why would I say that? Because one of the proclamations that he gave the apostles, he said, I give you power to tread. How do you tread? You tread by stepping on it. Your tread, tread upon serpents and scorpions. Jesus was not talking from a natural perspective. These were spiritual deities that Jesus gave them power to do because he was trying to show them what their authority was. Please hear what I'm saying. The Bible said, I'm going back, to, I'm going back to Acts chapter 16. It said they put their feet fast in the stocks. And the enemy desired to keep your feet fast in the stocks. So when he try to keep you confound to a space, he places stocks on you. I wish I had time to unpack how the enemy uses feet to keep people stuck. We have no idea. There are spiritual things that will take place. And without discernment, you will not have the ability to see it. But please hear me, since something is turning, Today, where it feel like you are spinning your own wheels. It feel like you are stuck. It feel like you're staying in the same place. It feel like you haven't moved. And because you feel like this, you may not understand that you may be under a spiritual attack. You may be in spiritual warfare, and the enemy has used stocks in order to keep you bound and stuck in the same place. But today, I decree and declare over your life 
than whatever foot or feet that has been placed in stocks, that have been placed in chains, that have held you, or shackles. I decree and declare that every shackle is broke by the hand of God, that every shackle is moved and consumed by the fire of God. Today I decree and I declare I release feet because the enemy understands if your feet can't move. Now, we've seen movies with slavery. And the first thing that you saw when it came down to slavery was shackles and chains upon people's feet. And it kept them from moving. It kept them from running. It kept them bound in a certain place because of the weight of the chains and the weight of the weight that was on the chain that they could not move fast. So today God is breaking evil fetters, fetters, chains that have held people bound, that have kept people without seasons, that have kept people in sorrow, that have kept people in prison, that have kept people from moving. Today, God is breaking the evil chains, the evil stocks and the evil feathers that have been placed upon feet. This is the season where God is going to give you speed. I'm declaring today that what you have missed seasons that you should have obtained that this day that God would give you speed. The Bible said when it came down to Elijah, the angel came and fed him a cake. He said you must run in the strip of what you just received. And the Bible said Elijah runs 40 days and 40 nights in what he has received. If you receive what I'm telling you today, then the Lord is going to give you speed. This speed he didn't stop the Bible said uh, Elijah outran chariots when he got in the gates. Listen to me today, that God is going to give you speed and grant you the speed that you will outrun your enemies so that you can make it into the gate, the gate of your greatness, the great of your purpose, the great of your destiny, the great of financial wealth. The Lord is going to give you speed today, and you're going to run in the spirit. This, this is one of the scriptures that's in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. It said, those that wait shall wait upon the Lord. He shall renew their strength and they shall run. God gives you that ability to run. You've waited long enough. Sometimes all God needs is an oracle to release something. All he needs is somebody to make a declaration over your life. To speak prophetically. To speak it into existence. To command and decree things to legislate, to overturn things that have been written against your life, to blot out evil handwritings and any ordinance that has been resting against you. Sometimes God will use an individual to cast down and destroy every satanic and demonic power that has been fashioned against you. And all you need to do is have an ear to hear and receive what God is saying. And this is the season and the hour and even the time that I'm releasing you from any type of bondage. I'm releasing you from any type of captivity. I'm releasing you from weapons of destruction. I'm releasing you from procrastination. I'm releasing you. This is your season of divine release. You are being released. You are being free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. This is your season and your hour to be released. Listen. The most difficult thing that I've learned in the body of Christ is for a believer to believe what they heard. Because we are so predicated on hearing our own thoughts, receiving and believing the negativity that comes within us. We are so predestined. Listen, we believe that. Everything that comes in our mind, everything that comes in our imagination, we believe it. And the fight of you believing it, Lord have mercy, the fighting you believe in it because you keep believing it. You keep receiving it. And when God speaks, let, let me tell you what a stronghold is. A stronghold is a mental barrier that, <laughs> that keeps the word of God and God outside of those perimeters. Strongholds. Strongholds are propagated in mind. They are part of imaginations. So your imagination is so strong, you can keep God out. You can keep his word out. Everything that transpires or everything that takes place is a fortified defense system. This is what a stronghold is. It is a fortified defense system. When you go to some houses, they're fortified. 
You go to some countries, castles are fortified. They have walls upon them. This is exactly what took place with the walls of Jericho. They were fortified by those walls. And no one could get in when they closed the gates because the city was fortified. So a stronghold is a mental, spiritual stronghold to where you have fortified it and your mind and your imagination is governed by your own ideas and whatever the enemy tells you. So you fortified it so that God can't even get in. And today God is breaking down every wall that has been fortified, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, God is breaking them. He He's casting down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. He's breaking it because minds, strongholds, become fortified defense systems that keep the enemy that gave you the thought, it protects it. This is what a stronghold is. That anytime God says something, you don't believe it because there's something that's in opposition against what he said. And it's hard for us to believe it because you have now a stronghold. And listen, when the enemy comes, and I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best. So, so let me explain it this way. Let me explain it from this perspective. In Matthew chapter 12, and, I, and I'm trying my best to explain it in such a way because we develop these ideologies, these mindsets. Sometimes they're governed by children because we develop. Racism has to be, somebody have to train racism. Racism have to be taught. Racism must be taught. It's taught. You grow up in an environment and you see it and it becomes a pattern of your behavior but the mind conforms to the environment that it is. So let me say this, we are nothing more than sponges. So whatever environment that you put us in, we soak up that environment. We cling to that environment and you cannot get anything else out of the sponge by what it, by what it didn't absorb. So whatever it absorbs, when you squeeze it, whatever you put in it will come out of it. And we have been sponges in environments to where people have taught us not to believe. People have taught us not to think further. People have taught us not to want to progress. People have taught us not to do things the right way. It's learned behavior. It develops a stronghold. It develops a mindset. And we even have it when it comes to churches that some churches refuse the change refuse to adjust, refuse to shift, and they become old wineskins because God can't put nothing in them new. Why? Because it is an ideology. It becomes a stronghold of the mind. And God is trying to do something in this season to change the mind of the believers. But he's not going to invade your mind. He's not going to invade your thoughts. He'll just try to give you another thought to subjugate the thought that you now have. When the enemy wanted to take the entire world, all he did was give evil thought. That was it. The battle with us and the warfare with us is in the mind. So the enemy is developing strongholds to make you think that God will not bring you into a season. And because you haven't seen the season, you build a defense system. Now you don't want to hear from God. You don't want to hear from a man of God. You don't want to hear from a woman of God. Because all of a sudden you develop the stronghold and your defense system will repel any word that God gives by any deity or being. This is a season to where God desires for you to be set free. The only reason Blow Joe showed up was to destroy your mind, was to invade your mind. Let me tell you how relationships truly work, okay? Let me tell you how Satan works with people. Let me tell you this. And I'll, I'm going to use Samson as a prime example. I'll use Samson and I'll use Delilah. Delilah had no interest in Samson at all. None. Delilah's assignment 
was to find out Samson's weakness. And when she found it out, they would reward her, and then she'll leave. So it didn't matter if they pulled out his eyes. It didn't matter if they cut his hair because she never had any type of interest in him. Her only obligation was to destroy him and be rewarded for it. And some people, when it comes to a relationship, is to meet you when you're weak, meet you when you're vulnerable, meet you when you're desiring somebody. That person was to show up in your life only to mess up your mind. They would do whatever they had to. If they would have to buy you something, they would have to take you to some places. They would have to sow into you. They would have to give to you. They would have to communicate with you. They would have to spend time. So they did all this because they were trying to get into your mind. They were trying to destroy your mind. And once they got in the mind, the body followed. So you gave up the body because they got in the mind. And so the relationship, the assignment that the enemy had, that I want to destroy them because I know that they're going to be great. I know what they're going to achieve. I know what they want to become because the only thing that I can do to stop them is use them against them. I have to use what they like. They love love. They desire love. So I have to send somebody. Watch this. And when God tell you I'm sending the husband, if you don't have discernment, the wrong one will come. If you don't know about imposters, because some people are only sent in your life as an imposter before the real one come. Imitators. To imitate, because they're looking to destroy mine. And we have so many people who have been distraught, who have made vows and said, I will never talk to another man again. I will never talk to another woman again. I would never allow myself to be done like this again. And you develop this mental stronghold. So even when God sends the right one, you persecute the right one because what the wrong one did. And now you miss seasons because the enemy has had you to develop a stronghold, a system that will not allow anybody else to come in and you become damaged goods. You was good before somebody came in and damaged you. So now you're damaged goods. You've been mishandled. You've been dropped. And God is telling you today that because of this mental stronghold, this battle that you are debating with yourself, that you won't even allow yourself to be happy because you won't even believe that it will be real later. So you resist and you fight. You're fighting for your happiness, but you're fighting not to be happy because you can't trust that this relationship will be valuable. You don't trust that this relationship will last. So you destroyed intentionally because of the mental strongholds. All because... The enemy sent someone as a seed to destroy you. And once they did their job, they left you and they hurt you. They disgraced you and then they left you. They left you agitated. And now every time you see an individual, a person, a male or a female, you don't want to have to deal with any of them because you still carry around the hurt of the pain because pain only resurfaces after it recycles. The resurfacing, which means the action, because it keeps recycling over and over again in your mind. So your actions dictate when it resurfaces because what you have recycled. Recycling means you took trash and made it valuable again. This is what recycling is, but this is the mental thing of the mind, the strongholds of the mind. Listen, let me tell you what happens in church. The same thing happens in church. This is why they call the church hurt. And most people don't know. Please hear me. Let me tell you several things that take place with church hurt. With church hurt, oftentimes, you don't know how great you are or significant you are is why you receive the church. But the assignment of the person, it could have been a pastor. It could have been a first lady. It could have been a prophet, an apostle, an evangelist. It could have been a minister. It could have been somebody that's in the pews that they targeted you. You were a target. 
You never saw your success, so the enemy brought your demise. And you're saying because this was a church hurt, now because you were hurt by the church, you won't become the church, and neither will you go back to church. And we blame God. So we develop this mental stronghold against God based on what man done, but not what God did. And we don't know that God had your assignment and you were next. And the enemy wanted to destroy who was next. Even the people in the body of Christ, the apostles, the one who walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus and did miracles, even they had a mental stronghold. The Bible said when it came down to Saul, who tormented the church, who tormented those that was in church, the Bible said, that when Saul was now converted over to Paul, he had come unto Christ and had his encounter with Christ on a Damascus road. None of the apostles desired to believe him, even though God had changed him, even though Ananias had laid hands on him. And we have so many people. What if Paul would have responded because the enemy was still trying to get Paul back by using church hurt by those who was in prominent positions, those who walked with Christ and talked with Christ. Look at the mental stronghold. Paul was going through a church hurt. And people, that when people see your past, for some reason they think that they can predict your future. It is a mental stronghold. Listen to me, please, to this. When you find people that refuse to change their mind, it is a place that God is identifying where they have been stuck. They've been stuck. The enemy has them bound. And even though they can operate in the anointing, they can prophesy. They can teach. They can raise classes. They can have conferences. They still have a mental stronghold. It is an area where the enemy has had them confound. So they're still teaching, preaching, and prophesying. But they don't believe in you. They don't believe the things that God has said to you. This is what happened to King Saul, the first king that took place in Israel, because he had some type of evil opposition that when it came to David, because there was a mental stronghold, David never said. He said that was the women who said, Saul killed his thousands, but David killed 10,000. A mental stronghold took place. And from that day forward, the Bible said that Saul countenance changed toward David. Why? Because the enemy invaded his mind, and there was a mental stronghold. And all the days of Saul's life, he came after David because of the mental strongholds. Not even God, Samuel, could convince Saul not to kill David. Look at the stronghold. And David was going through. It wasn't church, but it was somebody who was over him. It was a leader that was over him. And some leaders will try to destroy you when they see the greatness in you because of the mental stronghold that the enemy has over the leader's mind. It is a stronghold. And God today is trying to break the strongholds. There's a difference between a stronghold and a strong man. Let me tell you what the strongholds are for. The strongholds are for you to become the strong man. Okay. The Bible says in order to, I think it's in Matthew chapter 12, in order to, it is in Matthew chapter 12, in order to go into a strong man house, you first must bind the strong man. You have to bind the strong man. So in order to take his goods, you first must bind the strong man. So if God is calling you the good thing, whether you're the wife, whether you're the husband, if God is calling you the good thing, this is not about breaking in your natural house. This is about breaking in your spiritual house. He first must bind the strong man. So the first thing that you must understand, that you are strong. Whether you realize it, whether you feel weak, whether you don't understand it at all, God is still calling you strong. He's still calling you mighty. He's still saying you are chosen. You are the strong. Let the weak say that I'm strong. 
and God is telling you that even in your weakness, he's still saying, just what you regurgitating what I've already said scripturally, which means you agree with what I'm saying. And when you agree with it, God can give you strength. Let the weak say that I'm strong. So when you agree, any time that you can come into agreement and alignment with the word of God, all of a sudden you become, you get this strength back. Your hair grows back like Samson grow back. But in then this is what normally takes place. God gives you supernatural abilities when you can agree with his word. Agreeing with his word is agreeing with Jesus because Jesus is the word and the word became. And every time you can agree with the word, then something that you've agreed to, it helps you to become, helps you to become stronger, helps you to become more prominent, helps you have more faith because this is what gives you more faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the more that you hear is the more faith that you should receive, the more faith that you should walk in. It's according to your hearing. Listen to me. If it's according to your hearing, and if you can't hear, do you need a hearing aid? <laughs> do you need a hearing aid in this season? What's a hearing aid? A hearing aid is a device that goes into your ear. Now, and I'm going to use a hearing aid, please. Because if it goes into your ear, it means your senses at some point had been deafened by noise or whatever it is. And, and, and it's close into the eardrum. It's close. In, in one of my books, I, I made a statement, and I said this, and I wanted to hear it. I said, God created the eardrum like created the tabernacle. Because there are three parts to an eardrum. There's an outer ear and inner ear, and there's an inner, a middle ear. So the inner ear and the middle ear, the middle ear is the inner ear. So God created the tabernacle the outer court, the inner court, and the holies of holies. Your inner ear is connected to the soul. And that very thing is holy unto God. That soul of yours is holy because when God got ready to create the soul, the first thing he did, he breathed into it and said, man became a living soul. So without a body, the soul was still living. The soul was still active. So what God is trying to tell you, that when faith comes beyond, the, when faith goes beyond the middle ear into the inner ear, this thing is attached to your soul. And he's trying to ignite something. Listen to me. When you look in California, all we see in California are wildfires. And we see people trying to put out wildfires. And it doesn't matter how, uh, how our equipment and technology is and how they have planes now to gather water and drop it. There are some things that they can't put out. But there's only a wildfire when there's a drought. So whatever drought that you have had in your life is getting ready to cause God to have a wildfire that will never be put out. It won't be put out in your generations or the generation to come. It's going to ignite into your children. This is what God did with Moses with the burning bush. Moses didn't know anything about a bush being on fire. They always had bush fires, but there was a voice in this box. There was a voice that came out of this fire, and that voice ignited a fire in Moses' soul because Moses' soul was dry. Why? Because Moses came out of Egypt. He didn't know God, and God ignited a fire. So the only thing that Moses understood was fire, a wildfire. He saw the bush, but when he brought them out of Egypt, the Bible said when he brought them out, the whole mountain was on fire. Because he understood fire. No extinguisher can put it out. Hear what I'm trying to tell you today. That God is trying to do some supernatural things in your life. And it's, watch this, when it comes to the believers, the most difficult thing to believe it is to receive it. God never asks you to manifest it. To ask you to participate in it, but not manifest it. God desires to manifest it, but will you believe it? Will you receive it? And we say it superficially. Oh, I believe and I receive. But when the time comes, God checks to see where your belief system is. He checks to see it by your endurance, by what you have to go through. He checks to see if you're still believing. This is what took place with Jairus. Please hear this. The Bible said Jairus went to Jesus because his daughter was laying at the point of death. And the Bible said that he went, started a movement, worshiped Jesus, the Bible said. 
He worshipped him in moments of discomfort, in moments of despair. He brought him into a place of worship. He didn't even know that Jesus would even come to his house. But Jesus stopped teaching to come to a person who had worshipped him. He said, I'm going to you because if your faith is in your house where your daughter is, I'll follow you back to your house. And listen, he got Jesus to move. And the Bible says that in the process of him moving, Something stops Jesus from moving. But please let me tell you this. Please this. There was a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. 12. 12 represents government. It represents authority. It represents that God was getting ready to do something. So she couldn't go to number 13 because God functioned out of 12. There was 12 tribes of Israel. There was 12 apostles. There was 12 spies that Moses had. So God always functioned out of the number 12. Hear what I'm telling you. So she had 12 issues, 12 years. Jairus' daughter was 12 years old. And I want you to see this. His daughter was dying. The woman with the issue of blood was dying because they both had an issue. And what God was trying to show Jairus, that don't think that I won't come to your house. I'm going to show you what I'm getting ready to do. The woman with the issue of 12 years of blood, the Bible said that her blood, it stopped the issue that she had stopped when she touched to him. But J. Iris had touched her heart. Woo. Listen to me. The woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus him. But J. Iris touched his heart with worship. And the woman with the issue of blood got healed based on J. Iris. Based on J. Iris worship. And see, this is what God is trying to tell you in this season. When things look like they're not going to work on your behalf, baby, it's your worship that's going to bring everybody else into that season while God is bringing you into your own It's worship. Worship is a weapon that will destroy mental strongholds. It will tear down evil walls. It will draw God's attention. Because you can't worship God and the enemy at the same time. When you start worshiping mental strongholds, stuff that has been there since your childhood, it'll leave. Spirits that torment you. Spirits that harass you. Man, spirits that, oh, spirits that harass you. They'll leave. Why? Because they're no longer being worshipped. They're no longer being worshipped. And God, Jairus didn't know that the Bible says that the woman with the issue of blood, she's healed based on Jairus' worship. And he thought it was over for him and his worship started it. <laughs> she touches the hymn. And the stench of blood dries up. And Jesus said, someone touch me. Ultimately, the woman with the issue of blood, she confesses, it was me because this is my issue. And Jesus said, woman, your faith has made you whole. Watch this. But in the process of Jairus, Jesus moving for Jairus, the Bible said, that someone came to Jesus, came to Jairus while he was with Jesus and said, there's no need to trouble the master. She's already dead. Woo. Woo. Mm. And some of you are saying, mm, I no longer want to come to Jesus because my marriage is dead. Woo. Woo. Mm. Mm. I no longer need to go to Jesus. Because my relationship with my children is dead. Mm. I no longer want to go to Jesus because my relationship and my assignment is dead. I no longer, there's no need to trouble the master. And some of you, because of your situation, and you think that it will never rise. You think that you will never come to terms. You think that things will never come to grip. You think that you'll never get the job. You think that you'll never be healed. You no longer want to trouble the master. Woo. Woo. But can I ask you a question? What can trouble God? <laughs> what issue? What situation? What circumstances? What do you think that you can bring God that will trouble him? 
There's nothing that can trouble God. You know why? Because God is the prince of peace. Jesus is the prince. So if he's the prince, what can trouble him? What can disturb him? What can stop him? What can invade his environment or his territory to where he'll be worried or concerned? There is no worry or concern. Listen to what I'm telling you. If the enemy is telling you there's no need to trouble the master, God is telling you it's a sign. That you don't have to trouble him. All you need to do is just talk to him. When you talk to the master, he'll trouble your enemies. The Bible said, because listen, the enemy wanted to develop a mental stronghold in Jairus' mind to think that it was over, to think that it was finished. And what he started wasn't even worth it. And that's exactly what the enemy is trying to do to you. He's trying to tell you that what you did previously, it ain't worth it. I worship God. I went to church. I gave tithes. I was faithful. I was committed. And nothing never changed. And the enemy wants you to think and develop this mental stronghold like your season ain't coming. How is it that you can be with Jesus and Jesus is walking with you and Jesus is talking to you and you think that it's finished? It's not finished, baby. It's only starting. Mm. The enemy is trying to use a mental stronghold against your mind. Because as long as the enemy has your mind, let me go back to say this. Because we truly don't know how significant the mind is. How extraordinary this mind that we have, it is. In and, and Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. So God created the heavens and the earth. He created us, the animals and everything. He didn't create it just for him speaking. He thought about it being good. So this is why the Bible said, and the first day, it was good. The second day, and it was good. Everything he created, he said he created it was good. The only thing that he didn't say was good, it is not good that man should be alone. So God thought again. His imagination kicked in again, and then God made a woman because whatever God thinks, it must be good. It's the imagination. So the enemy understands that the only way that I can destroy them, the only way that I can keep them bound, the only way I can keep them confound is I have to invade their imagination, their thought life, because if I get their thought life, I can take the rest of their life. Do you honestly think that when Jesus was in the wilderness that the enemy could take him physically to a mountain? Right. Everything that Jesus did He wanted him to use his imagination against him. If you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread because Satan knew how powerful the imagination and the mind was because he knew whatever God thought it manifest. So when it came to Jesus, turn the stones into bread. Jesus had to look at the stone. He had to look at the stone and imagine the stone being bread. He was trying to develop a stronghold in his mind. When he fell, listen, I'm going to take you to a cliff. Throw yourself off the cliff. It is said that the angels would keep charge over you and keep you dash your foot against the stone. Everything was a mental battle. I'm going to take you to a high peninsula and show you all the kingdoms and the glory of the world. If you just bow down and worship me. These battles were in his mind. These are mental battles. Genesis chapter 11. The Bible said when God came in Nimrod and there was a people in the earth and they was with all one speech, one language, and they were all on one accord. And God, it moved God so much from heaven to God came down to see a tower that they were building in their mind because it wasn't built in the physical. This is why God said he made the statement that nothing that they imagined to do 
will be restrained, will be withheld. So if they, whatever they imagine in their mind because they were on one accord, God said, there's nothing that I can do. You see how powerful the mind is and how strongholds are? You see why the enemy attacks minds, the minds of the believers, because he can keep them in a position and keep them in a place to where they'll think that they're a failure and they'll function like a failure, they'll act like a failure, they'll live like a failure. If you function from that mindset, that ideology, it is a stronghold in that individual's mind. And the enemy wins. So with Jairus, he was trying to develop a stronghold, a mindset. And Jesus looks at Jairus and said, keep believing. Don't you dare listen to what he just said. You've been walking with me and talking with me. Don't you dare listen to the second voice. Please hear me. When God, when you hear the first voice, I guarantee you a second one comes. And the enemy will always tell you what you can achieve or what God can do. He's trying to develop a mental stronghold with you, a covenant. You know what a mental stronghold is? It's a covenant. Because you're either going to believe God or you're going to believe that you're going to believe Satan. Because the Satan is going to say something and the Spirit of God is going to say something. And the enemy and God is looking for which one are you going to believe? Because whatever you believe, you become. Whatever you believe, you receive. So when God said this, I'll show you all the natural reasons why they're going to become successful. The natural reasoning, why you can't have it. The natural reason, why it won't materialize. I'll show you that you say you're going to have a business, but where's your business plan? Where's your partners? Where's the banks? Nobody's going to prove you. And all of a sudden, you start believing in what you see naturally based on what God says spiritually. If God controls everything and the earth is his and the fullness thereof and the people that dwell therein, if God said it, then he can bring it to pass. But it takes your belief system and your participation in order to break beyond the barriers that the enemy has set in your mind so you can break the mental stronghold and go into your seats. But people are believing. They're believing failure because it's hard to receive success. And Jairus kept moving. He kept walking. And the Bible said when God finally, when Jesus finally got to his house, the Bible said they had minstrels. They had already hired somebody to have a funeral. <laughs> they had a funeral, and Jesus steps into the house. And Jesus said, listen, she's not dead, she's just asleep. And everybody, the Bible said, they laughed him to scorn. Listen to me, I want you to hear this. And I want you to see this because Jesus used this as an example. The people that are laughing at you are the people that God is going to take away from you. The Bible said when they laughed, Jesus to scorn. The Bible said that they put him out. Jesus put them out. He put them all out that laughed. He put them all out that didn't believe. Anybody that didn't have the same mindset as Jairus to stop him from believing, to develop a mental stronghold, the Bible said Jesus put him out. You ain't got to put him out. So when you see people falling away from you, when you see people not calling you, it's Jesus taking them away from you because they've developed the wrong, the wrong mindset and the mental stronghold and God is removed moving them away from you. This is what God did with Lot because Lot did not, could not see what he saw, what Abraham saw. So God had to move them away. So sometimes God has to move people out of your life so that you can have a productive life because these people are what's keeping you bound into these mental strongholds. Jesus put them all out. And the Bible said that he only kept James, Peter, and John. He kept those that had his mindset. He kept those who would believe. He kept those that knew what miracles was. And sometimes you better check your company. Because we, the company you keep will keep you in their company, will keep you in the downfall. Birds and feathers flock together. So you better be careful for your birds. 
because you can be an eagle and they can be a chicken and the chickens can't get off the ground, but the eagles are assigned to fly. <laughs> oh, have mercy. And you shall mount up as wings as eagles. Stop hanging with chickens when God has called you to mount up. This is your mounting up season. You got to change your cat. You got to change your company. Mount up as wings, as eagles. This is your season to mount up. Watch this. Because if you're hanging with chickens, I'm going to let you know, that you, I'm going to let you know the company that you're keeping, what it is. I'm going to let you know if you're hanging with chickens. Watch this. Because chickens, chickens will eat their own mess. Birds, eagles, like meat, they don't eat mess. That means the eagle have to be mature because the eagle doesn't need milk, it needs meat. And here God is trying to give you meat in this season, but you keep hanging with chickens and the chickens are eating mess. They're always gossiping. They're always lying. They're always doing different stuff. This is the mess today. And they're always in some mess. Why? Because they eat it. This is what fuels them, mess fuels them, gossip fuels them, lying fuels them. This is what it is. So if they're not in any kind of controversy, they are not fed. It's time for you to mount up. You got a different mindset. Your wings span. Listen, eagles fly and they soar beyond any bird. And the eagles don't normally use their strength. They extend their wings and the wind carry them. You hear what I'm telling you today? That God is trying to get you to allow you, watch this, to soar, which means the eagles, all you need to do is just do this in worship. And the wind, which is the Holy Spirit, will carry you to your destiny. It will carry you above the storm. Hear what I'm telling you? And your mindset will be completely different. You know why? Because the Bible said an eagle can see two miles before it gets to its prey. Futuristically, it can see further. Why? Because it can go higher. And God is trying to get you to go higher so that you can see further. But you've got to break the mental stronghold that the enemy has developed around your mind. Your defense system must be broken. These mental strongholds must come down. The Bible said that Jesus takes Jairus' daughter by the hand, says a word, my last daughter, my last second, arise. Listen, and she arises, and Jesus said, now feed her. She rises by his hand. Watch this. But God blessed Jairus because he had the stability to remove mental struggles and allow no fortified defense system that will come against God in his mind. So what society has done, society, where you've seen the economics collapse, economic collapse, you've seen demonic, demonic, I'm saying demonic, but parties, Democratic and Republican parties, fight against one another. You've seen Congress pass bills that they should never pass. You've seen a president that's just looking for popularity, my God. Listen, listen to me. So we're seeing all of this and what's happening with us in society and in Christendom. You are developing a mental stronghold because your belief system is in the earth system. It's in the United States system. It's in a system and you're developing a mental stronghold and you're not depending on God. And now you have animosity. Watch this over a president when you have a God. You wanted a president, you signed for him, you voted for him, but you didn't vote for Jesus. Listen, presidents can be voted in and presidents can be voted out, but kings are born for their position. Jesus was born to be king. He was fashioned to be king because he was king of kings and lord of lords. Before there was a man, he was still a king. Listen to me. And you cannot go beyond the borders, the boundaries that he set. Because you're dependent in horses and chariots. You're dependent in men. And God is saying, this is not your season to depend on men. 
not to depend on presidents when you have a God, when you have a king. You, this is the problem that they had with Israel, that they didn't want God. They didn't want the king. They wanted a natural king when they had a God. And God is saying it's time for us in Christendom to get out of your butt out of the natural. Get your head out of the clouds. Get your head out of these mental strongholds and start depending on God and not put people in positions that you think are qualified without God. God is trying to break limitations. Let me tell you this. Because we put limits on God. How can we have a limitless God that when he told Abraham, is there anything too hard for me? The Bible said in the New Testament, shall, it said nothing shall be impossible to them that believe. He would tell Abraham in the Old Testament, is there anything too hard for God? Change your mindset. Let me, let me tell you this. This is one way you know that you have a mental stronghold. You want to deliberate. God say something, you want to deliberate. You saying what God can't do, God is telling you what he can do. You're deliberating. Yeah, you, in other words, there's a debate and you're arguing. And you always tell God what you don't have because you don't know that you have him. <laughs> when there's a mental stronghold, there's always a debate. You're going to always argue. You're going to always be frustrated, and you're going to get frustrated with God because you're going to tell God what you don't have. I don't have no car. I don't have no job. I don't have no money. I ain't got no clothes. I don't have no baby daddy. I don't have no father. I don't have no mother. You're going to say something. I don't have a husband. I don't have a wife. My mama not here. My daddy died. You're going to always get in some type of debate when there's a mental stronghold because you don't believe. And so what sets the precedence for your environment is because of your mental stronghold. And you become the strong man. So if the strong man, he takes the goods, then you go to other people who you consider to be weak and you take the goodness out of them and you make them bitter and you make them strifeful and you make them envious and you make them upset. All of a sudden, you become the strong man and because of your mental stronghold, you're on the enemy side, no longer on God's side, and you're tearing down the image and the likeness of God because of the mental strongholds. And you know people who have mental strongholds because they cannot relate in a relationship. You, how's it supposed to be a relationship and you can't relate? You can't relate in the relationship because of the mental stronghold. And you won't allow anybody to love you. Mental strongholds, you won't allow people to love you. You won't. You'll let them get so far, and that's it. Why? Because you don't trust them. A sign that you have a mental stronghold, I don't trust my partner. I won't. You marry them, and you say you love them, but you don't trust them. It is a mental stronghold. And listen, you know what that means? So if you was hurt... I want you to hear this. If you were hurt 10 years ago, five years ago, and time has passed. So if it was five years ago, 2018, you in 2018. Let's say five, six, seven years ago. Let's say you was in 2018. You were hurt in 2018. And you're carrying that hurt into 2022. You know what that means? You've never left 2018, the central moment. You've never left. You're still there. Yes, time has changed. Your hair has probably changed. Your job has changed. Your car has changed. Your body has changed. But you have not changed from 2018 because you're still carrying that mental stronghold to where it was started. And everybody from 2018 to 2022 that came across your path, you will destroy them. You will annihilate them. You will hurt them. Why? Because of the mental stronghold that started in 2018. And so the enemy has been using this, not just with relationships, 
in marriages or relationships with spouses or families or children or companies or corporations, but he's also used it in Christ. Let me tell you how to check your relationship with Christ. This is a key and a clue. I want you to do self-inventory. Normally, we don't do self-inventory. We don't look in, we look out. Because we can see flaws in other people because we refuse to look in mirrors. We can see everybody else's mistakes. But we refuse to pass by that mirror. The Bible said, watch this, this is how you check to see if you have a mental stone go. If you're still struggling and suffering from people from, from they did to what they did to you, what they said to you, how they said it and when they did it, the Bible said, this is how you check your relationship. If you be in Christ, then you are a new creature. Old things have passed away. You know what that means? You don't have the same mental capacity. The strongholds are gone. You are free. This is why the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 43, and I think it's in verse 19, remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. For behold, I will do a new thing. And people can never get to the thing that God has predestined new because they're so predicated on that stronghold and that mindset of them functioning from the old. This is why Paul would say in the New Testament, I press toward the mark of the higher call. Why? Because I'm forgetting those things which are behind me. Because those things which are now behind me, I got past the mental strongholds that was in my mind. I got past it. So even when he was expressing that there's a war going on in my members, oh, this wretched man that I am, Paul had mental strongholds. He couldn't get past his past and what he had done. There was a battle that was going on and a war that was waging in his mind because of the mental strongholds. And God is trying to set minds free today. Imaginations free. It doesn't matter if you come into a church. The church can be free, but you can walk into it bound. And you can walk out bound when everybody else is free. Why? Because it's not your environment. It's what you believe. What you believe is conducive to your environment. It makes your environment. And when you look throughout scriptures, there is a pattern from Genesis all the way to Revelation. The pattern was it was trying to get people to believe. Moses, I'm not eloquent in speech. Look at the mental stronghold. I, God, God couldn't even use the man that he desired because of a mental stronghold. You're talking about your speech. But you can learn the Egyptian language, the Egyptian culture. You can learn sorcery and astrology. But now all of a sudden, if you can't talk for God, look at the mental capacity and the mental stronghold that we have. Abraham is talking to God. He leaves Mesopotamia. He leaves the place where he is. And then in Genesis chapter 15, he's having a conversation with God. And Abraham and God said, I am the God of Abraham. Fear thou not, for I am thy God. I am with thee. There's no need to fear me. And Abraham says a statement right after God said, fear thou not. I am your exceeding and great reward. And Abraham saying, Lord, what would you give me? Stand that I go childless. And Eleazar is the steward in my house. And he wanted to give Eleazar all of his inheritance. And God said, no, sir, your, your inheritance, you would have a child and he's going to come out of your own loins. And Abraham, God had to break a mental, a stronghold of his mind that I'm getting ready to do something in you that's even going to, that's even going to uh, uh, mesmerize you that's even going to challenge you when I say it. And here God is saying today, it's not matter where you are. See, we normally focus on the outer. We do. We focus on everything outer. Because our minds are conditioned to our environment. 
But God said, wait a minute, I thought you live, you move, and you have your being in me. What about, watch this, the environment, not the outer environment? Have you forgotten, according to John chapter 4 and verse 4, I thought it said, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. So if the greater one abides and resides, it will tear down and destroy demonic mindsets. And this is what God is trying to do. And let me tell you this. When you believe, it's not according to a person's faith. It's according to yours. Because, see, if you look at your environment and the pattern of people's behavior, it will make you think that what God said is not valuable or pliable. It's not true at all. And so you develop this resistance. It's crazy that we have an immune system when it comes to God. And God's word, we have become immune to it. You take pills so long, it don't even work. Take medicine so long, it stops working because your body has developed a system to where it will no longer be effective. And because you have been out of season so long, no matter what God says, you have become immune to his word. You have developed a system. It's a mental stronghold. And God today is releasing you from every mental stronghold. Watch this. And every strong man. Today is a day of freedom. So even the phrase that I'm getting ready to use. This is where the enemy attacks you. He attacks you in your psyche. He attacks you in the psyche, which means the mind. So he'll cause a disorder. If God only moves with decency and order, so how he causes the disorder is the psyche of the mind, psychological disorders and diseases. So what happens, he's trying to call a disorder, a place to where you will not obey God in the psyche, psychological disorders. You know how you do computers? I'll show you how we do computers. Sometimes, in order for you not to get a virus, you need to have some type of protection. A protection plan. Yeah, you got to have it. We have Norton and we have all of these other virus protection plans. Can I tell you what your virus protection plan is? Your virus protection plan is God's word. As long as you got your virus protection plan, which means your Bible, then the enemy can't be used pop-ups where things will pop up in your life to try to download things into your mind. Because, listen, when it came down to Adam, you know how Adam and Eve died? They died. Death came through downloading. It's what they saw. Eve saw the fruit that it was good, knowing that it was bad. She saw it was good, gave to her husband. He knew it was bad, and death came through downloading. They downloaded it into their system. But today I declare over your life that there will be no downloading, that God will now remove every virus that has been downloaded into your life since you were a child. And he's going to now give you the protection plan, now in the name of Jesus, that his word will take preeminence in your life, that his word will be predicated, that this word will now go forth in your life to re-erase. Watch this here. I, I love this because when we were children, my mother bought me a, um, a Etch-A-Sketch. And it didn't matter. <laughs> it didn't matter what was written on the Etch-A-Sketch because we would write all kind of stuff. We would draw all kind of stuff. But there's something that well, I learned about the Etch-A-Sketch. They had a little knob on it. And with that knob, no matter what you wrote, it had the ability to erase it all and start you over from fresh. So what God is doing today, he's using your mind today as an etch sketch It doesn't matter what was written on it. It doesn't matter the image or the imagination. God is using it today as an etch sketch He's re-erasing everything that was pre-programmed there, and he's downloading the real thing. He's downloading peace. 
He's downloading prosperity. He's downloading wealth. He's downloading promotions. He's downloading increase. He's downloading ministry. God is downloading it now. Why? He's rewriting what has been written. And he places his stamp of approval on it. Listen, I pray today that what was said, that you've got an understanding out of it. I don't know who's watching today, but it must have been important when God shifted and changed the entire message. And that's how you know how important you are to God, that he shifted and changed the message. God wanted me to talk about something completely different. But today, because of who's watching or who's even in the studio, he changed it because that's how important you are to him. That's what you mean to him. I thank you today for tuning in to Christ is King. I'll see you next Saturday on Christ is King.